Okay, so today we have uh, Dr. Nick Carlton. I uh, appreciate you joining us. And if you just take a quick minute to introduce yourself, and then we'll jump into this. Sure. I'm Nick Carlton. I'm a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, I'm currently the principal investigator for the RCMP Longitudinal PTSD Study. And I've had the pleasure of working with uniformed personnel in a variety of capacities for oh, about a, almost a couple decades now in different ways. So uh, I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. And for those listening, I have a lot of uh, U.S.-based listeners, the Royal Canada Mounted Police. It's the equivalent to the FBI. So that's who we're going to be talking about today. This is a Canada's perspective, but that's our neighbor up north. And I feel like if your numbers are this this high, our, ours can only be worse, in my opinion, because I feel like your approach is way better than anything that I've heard that we're doing currently. So we're going to jump into that. What inspired you to get involved with helping first responders and uh, the police department? Uh, well, there have been lots of different things uh, throughout my life. I've had the the benefit of being supported and uh, and helped by police officers and other first responders and public safety personnel on, on a, several occasions. So with my family members, I have friends and family members who either have been serving or are currently serving uh, in a variety of different capacities, uh, including, uh, including among uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and our municipal police forces. So uh, I, I take it quite personally because I know these people uh, in a lot of cases and I, and I care about them. I think uh, when I began uh, my clinical work many years ago now, uh, and I was a student, I, I think one of the real standout, uh, well, when I was at the very beginning of, of my academic work, actually, the very first research project that I ever did was just caught on the heels of 9-11, actually. And there was so much, I mean, you guys know this, right? But there was so much media coverage for 9-11. There were so many, there were so many things happening. And one of the things that that I happened to, to notice and that sort of stuck with me and and was as everybody's running out, right? And and running away as they should, right? The civilians are running away from from the disaster. And at the same time, you've got police and fire and paramedics and emergency services running directly towards these uh, these massive disaster situations. And unfortunately that's not the only disaster that they run towards. So you've got this, this very small proportion of our population who we all critically depend on, who are constantly putting themselves in harm's way and, and are, are being asked to do more and more with less and less. And I think the more that I think about, about what they're doing to serve all the rest of us, it, it makes it a really compelling rationale for why I wanted to help. And about 2015 or so, uh, late 2015 ish. Uh, one of uh, a few leaders came together uh, in my local community. A few different uh, different chiefs happened to. It was just chance, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, they happened to contact me all with the same question within about a two week period, uh, and that question was, "Well, what's the best that we have? Uh, what does the research literature happen to show is the best to help these people with the challenges they're seeing?" And so I did like any good prof. I asked my graduate students to go out and scour the literature and bring back in a, some kind of an assemblage here. Right. And what we found out real fast was two really important things. The first thing that we found out was we don't know. We don't have best practices yet for helping them because that's not how we design solutions for PTSD originally. That's not how we design mental health care for trauma, uh, not specifically for these groups. And the second thing we found out was we really didn't have a good handle. Uh, Minister uh, Ralph Goodale at the time uh, hosted a national roundtable. And one of the things he asked me to come to that roundtable with was, Nick, tell me how many RCMP officers have trouble with PTSD. So again, like a, this was only a couple months after after those chiefs contacted me. And uh, like any again, like any good prof, I sent the graduate students to go and look this up. And as it turns out, we didn't have robust numbers. And in fact, internationally, even the best guess that we had was somewhere between seven and thirty-seven percent had trouble with PTSD. Slightly us. different numbers, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, just off by a smidge. Yeah. So right. you can't really go to anybody saying I need budget to support, you know, between seven and thirty-seven percent of you know about right. fifty thousand people. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. Oh. So then yeah, that's too big a rate. That eventually led to uh, what we're going to discuss a lot about today is the PSP PTSI longitudinal study. So where did that idea come from? Like, it seems like it was slowly pieced together. Did you have like anything to base this off of or like 
any starting platform? Bits and pieces, actually, and lots of it, actually. Uh, so you're right. That's exactly what happened. It, it grew emergently. Uh, like by 2017, we collected data where we realized about half of our, our CMP officers were screening positive for one or more mental health disorder. Uh, we just updated those numbers, by the way, recently, like uh, within the last six months or so, releasing those. And now it's up to two thirds that are screening positive. And now that's not all PTSD, one or more mental health disorders, including PTSD. Uh, but when we began doing the, the study that we're talking about today, um, the first thing that we stopped to, to, to take a look at was, well, okay, uh, basically we were asked, what would a, what would a Cadillac-style solution look like? And we said, well, we don't have enough research evidence to know what best practices are. So you should build something that you think will not only help inform you so you're smarter at the end of the study, but can actually help people as part of participating in the study. Because if you can do both of those things at the same time, then everybody's getting something out of it, and you're still making advancements for the for the the, the men and women who are going to put the uniforms on in the future. And so right. that's that was where we started. And then uh, the next step was we reached out to to experts in PTSD uh, from all around the world, uh, and a lot of it is actually run out of the United States, the National Center for PTSD, and uh, the your, your scientific director and leadership there of Dr. Terry Skeen. You guys have astounding people. <laughs> Right. the states that do work. Um, and so he was one of a, a large uh, set of team members uh, from a variety of countries that came together. And we said, well, let's design what this would look like. Uh, let's, let's build a system. And then let's see if we can work with the RCMP to deploy this initial system. So we'd have to measure people. And we'd want to follow them throughout their careers. We'd have to start when they're cadets at the beginning, because we don't know what they look like really at time one. And then we want to follow them throughout their training and after you deploy them. And then in addition to that, we've got to design some kind of an intervention. We need something that we think will actually help them improve their mental health. Mm -hmm. So to do that, we we went back to literature and we began taking a look, well, what do we know about training programs so far? And, and there was very little research evidence on those training programs. Uh, but there was a team, so all of this was sort of happening in real time. There were teams that were beginning to look at those training programs and what was available. And a lot of them had the same, the same built-in challenges. So if you're going to deliver, if you're going to give somebody a skill uh, of some kind, most of the time, you're going to start them off relatively easy with the skill. You're going to have somebody that has expertise, show them what it's, what it's supposed to be, whatever the skill is. And then you're going to teach them how to do that. They're going to practice it. You're going you're gonna to re-up it with them again. You're going to test them on it. You're going to do it over a fairly long period of time. And their skills are going to develop and get better and better as you go. Um, we haven't been treating mental health like that. For the most part, we treat mental health solutions with training uh, much differently, where we bring somebody in for four hours or six hours or one hour, and we say, sit down, and we're going to give you this information really fast, and you're going to learn this information, and then that's going to permanently change you're yeah, gonna be healed. Up. Yeah, I, good. I, I looked at one. Of, I looked at one of your studies that you provided, and it was uh, one second. Uh, there are dozens of programs por- uh, reported to support PSP mental health, most focusing on knowledge and then reducing stigma. And it's like, okay, you guys are good, and, and it is. It's and that's what I've I've kind of bumped into in my search for like, what is PTSD? What are we doing to help it? It seems like people are like using uh coping mechanisms and they're teaching a coping mechanism like this will heal you and i'm like well it might help for a while you know but i feel like you've integrated so much more into it i didn't mean to cut you off i just thought that was really interesting that your approach is layered you're not only getting them when they first come in and there's so much cool stuff that uh your study showed like when they first come in they're actually more resilient than like than civilians and i was like that's interesting you know, and that's pretty cool. And then the, another thing that shows uh, the daily tests that you perform, the daily mental health, the ones that do it every day have a increase of resiliency, a decrease in mental health issues. I was like, that's really impactful. But then we look at like the numbers of how many people have multiple mental health challenges, as well as uh, PTSD and that number you just said, 50% to two thirds. So it's like, there's something we're doing wrong, you know? And it like brings me to like, are do we deteriorate resilience you know like how do how are we getting from more resilient than c- civilian populace to almost I, I think it was five times more likely to plan a suicide that seems like you know something happened there 
I, I agree with you. Yeah. And so, so you're right. Those are the kinds of things we're finding already with the RCMP studies. So what we've found is exactly what you said. Uh, they are more resilient. They are coming with better mental health. And in fact, a lot of this is a lot of the, the platform for everything we've done so far coming out of the military research. By about a hundred years ago, certainly by the end of World War II, if not by the end of World War One, the military already knew you don't deploy people for more than 240 days to a high stress zone because 100 percent were coming back symptomatic. So they started cycling people through and they started building structures for that. For our police and our other first responder community members, though. So that's not what we do. We take them and we take them from a safe space. Or, sorry, we take our military from a safe space and we deploy them to a very unsafe space. But then we bring them back home to a safe space here. For a police officer, for example, we take them and deploy them and their family and their friends to an unsafe space. And we leave them there for 25 years. Like, for them, it is an unsafe space. That's, that's why the rest of us get to enjoy it as a safe space. Right. right, because somebody's keeping it safe. So we think that the evidence so far suggests that they start their training with better mental health than the general population, which contradicts one of the big arguments that we've we've heard for about a hundred years now, which is if you just hired more mentally healthy people instead of hiring these people that have mental health problems to begin with, then you wouldn't have this difficulty. Well, right. I'm sorry, the data doesn't hold that so far. The data actually suggests they're starting really healthy and really resilient, and then you're deploying. Yeah. And if that's the case, the na- the most logical solution thereafter is it's not that you hired the wrong person. Yeah. It's what you're asking to do afterwards and how much support you are or perhaps are not providing right. them to do that job. Absolutely. So, I think that's pretty cool. And I was hoping you could put in perspective, like uh, when you say they're they're going into like traumatic situations, traumatic environments, like compared to a normal civilian, like how much exposure are they getting? That's a great question. So in the general population, the best estimates we have, at least at least in North American or, uh, or, or North American, UK, Australian estimates, New Zealand estimates, we think the general population, uh, someone like me will be exposed to five or fewer potentially psychologically traumatic events in my life. So events that might lead to me having difficulties with PTSD. In contrast, for our police officers, our other first responders and public safety personnel, they're exposed near as we can tell to hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of those events. So you're talking about an or like off the scale differences in exposure. And it's because when one of us gets into trouble, the first we call 911 and you deploy these people to deal with whatever the trouble is. So I might only get five of those. But the poor people that are coming out to look after me, this is just a Tuesday for them, right? Like yep. they're re-exposed again and again. And the exposures are, are just off the charts. And in some cases, the, the, the painful irony is a lot of those of us who might then make decisions about uh, about resourcing and funding and are sort of armchair quarterbacking, whatever's going on with, with our police or our paramedics or our firefighters uh, afterwards, uh, we're not ones that are, regular, that are more regularly exposed. They're not interacting with us as often as they are with people who, for example, might be of lower socioeconomic status or might be having difficulties with drugs or difficulties with poverty in general. And so we're not seeing the kinds of exposures that they're seeing either. Uh, and in, in the States, the police officers there, we see on the news, they're, they're facing some tremendous challenges on a lot of different fronts. Social and, scrutiny and demonized, yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, really, it's, I, I like a, I like a lighter version of it just to, just so that we don't end up in a, in a political space. But Absolutely. if I'm speeding and I get pulled over and a police officer pulls me over and I'm mad at the police officer, that's pretty irrational. That's like yeah. the teenager getting mad at mom and dad because yeah. they got busted stealing the car keys. Well, yeah. okay, but who was actually at fault here? The cop yeah. who pulled me over or the guy speeding? Yeah, like, <laughs> he, he probably didn't, he or she didn't want to pull you over. It's just like, ugh. Yeah. This guy, or, you know. to do that day, right? And you, yeah. I mean, there was a classic joke, you know, don't you have anything better to do? And the police officer said, Yes, but you made me stop and yeah. deal with you. Yeah, but your yeah, choices led to this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that leads me to stigma. Oh. Why do you think we still struggle with such a bad stigma with PTSD? Because it's not like it's a secret or it's new. Like, there's like you mentioned in one of the videos that I watched, uh, 1600s, there's written documentation of someone referring to his PTSD and 
I can't remember the exact context, but there's like uh, petroglyphs or something along those lines of showing ghosts of dead warriors from like back in the BC times, you know? So it's like, mm-hmm. this isn't new, like Rambo, like the movie Rambo, he had PTSD, you know, like, and he killed like a whole police force. So it's like, this isn't new. Why is it still like seen as weak? I, I think there's a lot of parts to that. It's a, that's a really smart and complicated question. So I think part right. of the first part is, is a broad culture piece. So let's let's maybe talk about each of the different pieces of this puzzle because it's a it's a it's a rat nest to fix, and this is right. why. So one of the first things is uh, a lot of these population, a lot of these professionals are still coming. Uh, they're men that are doing a lot of the service here, and and as a broad culture, not forever, but certainly for the last I don't know, let's say 100, 200 years or so, we've framed that men need to present themselves in certain ways, that emotions other than anger are bad, that uh, there's quotes from uh, World War One and World War II doctors that, and I'm paraphrasing the quote there, real men wouldn't have a problem with seeing all of these things. Well, okay, if real men wouldn't yeah. have a problem with killing people, why do we have to spend so much time training them so that they're able to do it? Yep. And if real men wouldn't have a problem with their friend being killed, I'm not entirely sure we're on the same page with what real men are. Right. But that's part of our culture and our language. Real men shouldn't have problems with these things, but that stands in, even if I agreed with that, which I don't, that stands in stark contrast to what we want from groups like our police officers, our firefighters, our paramedics, our correctional workers. We want people who are compassionate, who are community oriented. We're there to to build bridges and support the community. Right. Right. So you're starting out in a bit of a bad place already because we've set up a, a basic narrative that says, Boys don't cry. Real men have a problem with this. But I don't know that I want a police officer who wouldn't have a problem with his friend being killed, for example. Like that. I feel like I don't know. Yeah. 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 And suppressing and holding that stuff down leads to drinking, drugs and all that. I was flipping through because I remembered uh, uh, someone told me like dereliction of duty. Like they can kill you for that in the time of war. And I was like, and before we had this chat, I was like, that popped in my head and I looked it up and it is, it's in there. And it's like dereliction of duty. If you're, uh, was it be- improper behavior in front of a enemy force or something along those lines can result in uh death and them killing you immediately. And I'm like, that's in the military law. So like, if that's the way it is, then it, I can still see why it is seen as a weakness. Mm-hmm. And we do. We also want that, and 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 it's painted as a narrative, right? Like, a, right. and and to some degree, right? If you imagine, if a firefighter is coming to rescue me to, with the pull the jaws of life out, or if a police officer is rushing in because he's, he's he or she is dealing with an active shooter, or a paramedic is trying to deal with my parent having a heart attack, I, in that moment, I don't want them to break. Like, I kind of need them to be stoic, right? I need them right. to. Because I'm not stoic in that moment. I'm in trouble. So I need right. somebody to manage the situation. Yes. But because of that, we can't let that then bleed out to the rest of their lives where they can't have trouble with the fact that they just saw something terrible. But we haven't built the system that allows that to happen. Mm-hmm. And and changing that system, because you got a basic culture issue and you've got some, some system necessities, like a changing that system is going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a concerted effort on all of our parts. But you know what? Our military and our veteran communities have actually done a really great job over the last 40, 50 years of starting to change parts of that culture and and sort of setting an example for how we can reimagine that. We just need to help the others too. Absolutely. Uh, that brings me to uh, normalizing mental health. And I, I thought that's what jumped out to me with the daily inspect or the daily mental health check. So like it, I was like, what from my perspective, because it's, it's a, I'm at my level. That's all I can be, you know? So I'm like, for, for my level, like, why would this work? And it's like, well, you're normalizing the mental health. So it makes people a little bit more curious. And the more you do something more open to it, you become. So I was curious from your perspective, like the daily checks, why would that decrease mental health issues? All the reasons you just said, exactly those reasons. Um, it, it's it's very much like anything else. We we treat we got to quit treating mental health like it's really this different kind of alien version of health. If I'm going on a diet and I and I'm honest with myself and I write down what I'm actually eating every day, right? right? If I'm honest with myself and I write down what I actually drank or exercised or whatnot, 
and I monitor that over time, I start to make better choices, right? We, we all know that journaling for diet and exercise, you get better. We wear watches and whatever else. Yeah. And it nudges you at you know, 10 o'clock at night saying, hey, you didn't quite finish your exercises right now. If you got up right now and did a 30-minute workout, you'd close that ring. We're probably not going to get up that moment and close that ring for a 30-minute workout yeah. at 10 o'clock at night. But the next morning when the alarm goes off and you're supposed to be hitting the gym, now you're more likely, right? Mm. And it's top of mind. And, and you're able to monitor it. The other thing is from the dailies, you can actually watch your mood change and then you can start to identify, you know, every second Tuesday, something's wrong. Well, okay, as soon as I see that, then I, then I can take action. I have a chance to do something about it, right. right? I can go, what's going on every second Tuesday? Oh, it turns out I, I don't know, every second Tuesday, I've got to take the garbage out first thing in the morning and it frustrates me. Well, okay, could you take the garbage out Monday night instead? That way you're not mad Tuesday morning and all of a sudden, those little things add up. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I like that. And if you're screening for mental health disorders, one of the things that we've seen in the study already is that if you if people can monitor the real symptoms of different disorders, then they can watch. And if a symptom suddenly jumps up, they don't have to wait until they meet diagnostic status or clinical, like full-blown clinical status. You, you wouldn't wait if you had a cut on your leg until it was gangrenous right. before you'd go get help, right? You'd go, I'm cut. I'm going to go get help. We're seeing that ongoing monitoring also helping with indications that's that's what it's doing is, right. hey, I think you're injured. And somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm injured. I'm going to go get help. And they can get the injury under control instead of waiting until it's way harder. Right? Yeah, I agree. So, I think that's definitely one of the reasons why I struggled so hard is because it wasn't instead of dealing with the PTSD when it first happened, it was like I did. I wasn't able to deal with it until years of trauma. And then after that, you know, now looking at mental health, like not only can it make you better. It can make you better at your job. It can, like, you can just wash that stuff off and not carry it on and be distracted by it during those ops, you know? Because there's times that I've jumped in the ops because it, that situation reminded me something of a previous call, you know? So I, that showed me that I was bringing something into that area and maybe not completely present like I should have been. I, I, I think that I think there's such huge opportunities to do exactly that. Like, let's reimagine it. We know we're going to ask these people, our military, everybody's putting on a uniform. We know we're going to ask them to go and do some hard stuff. So instead of blaming them when they get injured, let's expect, yeah, there's a, yeah. There's a chance you're going to get hurt. If that yeah. happens, let us know as soon as possible. We can keep you on the job. We can keep you in the uniform, but we've got tools and let's, let's engage with it and fix it the exact same way that if you broke your leg, we yeah. wouldn't just do it, but it's like crutches. Get back to the front line, right? And be like, no, you're good. I'll you go. Yeah. Like, what? It, just, no it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, let's treat mental health the same way. And as soon as we do that, I I, I think it's, it'll still take time because it's a big health shift. But boy, like even that free framing, I think can make a huge difference for everybody who's choosing to serve like this. And, and we I think so that. too. Like, yeah. it, I, and I think by, at this point, it's pretty obvious, you know, so I don't understand why people are so re resistant about it. But then again, it all boils down to the dollar, you know, and I feel like that's where a lot of people get hung up. They're like, well, how much is this going to cost? And I'm like, I don't know. How much does your safety cost? You know, because that's ultimately what we're saying. Like the better they are, the better we are, the better society is. So I, I just I can't wrap my head around the resistance to that. Me neither. But I agree with you. What does your safety cost is a powerful question. What's that worth to you? Um, and you know what? Again, every bit of data says mental health works like physical health. It costs you way less to brush your teeth every day than to wait until such time as you need massive orthodontic surgery because you've got cavities everywhere. Right. So which one do you want to pay for? Because you're going to pay for it. So do you want to yep. pay for the ongoing support that keeps somebody healthy and in their job and happy and supported? Or do you want to pay for like the, the yeah. massive intervention yeah. that is required afterwards? Because yeah. usually the second one costs you more. Yeah, but yes, you're right. You don't pay for it today. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, but you do pay for the little prevention today. But somebody's picking up that tab, and you're picking up that tab now from somebody who didn't fix it 30 years ago for the for the guy that's sitting in front of you. So we're all paying for it. Absolutely. Wouldn't you rather pay for it in a way where everybody who's serving feels supported, and um, and probably also we could save some money as well if you if you don't like the moral argument, which I think you should. Right. Uh, but if you don't like that one. It's a pretty solid economic argument too. Yeah. If you'd like that, it one. costs a whole lot on the back end if you're not doing the pre yeah. pro proactive aspect of it. Uh, which reminds me, you're talking about teeth. Uh, I had a moment the other night. I was it was late and I was tired and I, I didn't want to brush my teeth. <laughs> and this is a piggyback on the working out. Like I, 
I was like, get up, don't be lazy, you know? So I went and brushed my teeth, but I feel like that's a, that's discipline, which I think is a form of resilience. And you, oh, you yeah. talk a lot about resiliency in here. And what are some ways I, I started seeing resiliency different? You know, I've talked to a few people and you were one of them that kind of sparked the idea. Uh, you're like, I don't want people in Canada to be as resilient as people in Ukraine being bombed. That's not the type of resilience, you know, it's like, so then I was like, well, you're right. Like resiliency is on a spectrum. Like how do we hone in the resiliency needed for first responders? Like, what is, what does that even mean? You know, like how, how do you become more resilient to be exposed to traumatic events? Uh, I, that's part of what the RCMP study is trying to get you really good evidence-based answers for. But I think at a broad level, part of it is identifying where you're at risk for different things because we all are. So part of it is, is are there things where you are more or less at risk? So if you think about it from a, a, an exercise perspective, right? Um, there's some folks where their legs are going to be a lot stronger and some folks where their chest and arms are going to be a lot stronger. Well, we probably want, if they're going to go out and surf, we probably want their legs and their arms and their chest to all be comparably strong. Right. That might mean that I've got to do more push-ups and you've got to do more leg press. But it's not because either of us is, is weak per se. It's just we've got different strengths. So the first mm -hmm. thing is to identify where we maximize those at the beginning in, in training. The second piece is to make sure that we're giving people access to the tools that we already know work. So part of what we did with the RCMP study was we looked at different treatments that we already know work after somebody's got a mental health injury. And then we identified ones where there's skills in those treatments. And we said, well, those skills are things that you don't need to wait until you have a mental health injury to learn. We could teach you the skill now. You could practice it here before you have an injury and then be ready to use it going forward. And in theory, being able to use that skill the whole time, even when you're exposed to those stressors, could overall reduce the, the impact of those stressors to give you more capacity. So that's another way to build resilience. Then the next piece, I think, is make sure that your team feels supported. So you, you see a big part of resilience is if you think that if you think your team has your back and you feel like if something goes wrong, they're going to support you and, and they value you, that in and of itself is a huge piece of resilience. And I, I think we could be doing a lot better uh, for all our first responders uh, on, on that front, making them feel like the community, their leadership, their, their politicians, their governments all have their back. Right. I think we see that in short bursts. Like we like in nine eleven, we definitely saw that in nine eleven coming out of the communities from all across the all across the country, all across the world. But it doesn't last very long. Just like in COVID, as the paramedics were trying to deal with all of those bonus challenges, and the nurses, we do it in bursts, but it doesn't last. Mm -hmm. But I think we all need to be reminded. It's part of it's on us to support their resilience, so that right. we are being their servants. Uh, something else that jumped out in the study right on that uh, is lower probability of having mental health if you have a better support structure and you're talking at work but also at home and in your social circle and that's something that i've seen a pattern with the people i've talked to those that had like a really good like wife husband at home kids and family who they didn't see their dad as like broken or sick dad talked about it and was like hey i'm having struggles and everybody's like cool we're on board we're going to support it like that also is in that same wheelhouse i feel like is really beneficial I totally agree. And that's that's part of why some of my colleagues are doing work specifically on public safety families, uh, because because they're all kind of serving together, like military families yeah. serve together. Public mm -hmm. safety families serve together. Right. They're on they're experiencing stuff. The rest of us aren't right. Mum or dad are on shift work. Sometimes it's two weeks on, two weeks off. Like it's yeah. they can be called out at a moment's notice. The kids are watching TV going there's this disaster and there's mom or dad yeah. running towards the disaster. Mm -hmm. But if that whole family system is also supported, then that family not only supports the, the, the member who's serving, right. But, but they also support each other and, and supporting those family systems is critical. That's who we run to first, right? The first person yeah. who's going to notice you're in trouble is your spouse mm -hmm. or, or whoever your next kid is, right? Like yeah. whoever you're, where you're living with. That's, we got to support the home team yeah. quite literally. And the home team for that. Yeah. Uh, something else I thought was fun was uh, I, I never I never read or seen anything like it before. It was one second, so I don't misquote it. It was about uh, personality traits. 
So certain personality traits have less probability of mental health than others. And I was wondering if you could talk on that a little bit. I was like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, there's so there's early indications, and we're waiting for for big longitudinal data, which is what we're building now. Right. That uh, things like heightened levels of emotionality or fearfulness might increase some of the risk for somebody to have mental health challenges down the road, and that's that's certainly one of the possibilities. And we're hoping we're going to be able to answer that. One of the interesting things, though, that we've already found out uh, with respect to personality seems at least uh, at least in Canada at times counterintuitive, but I, I would imagine it's probably true in the United States as well. The personality, when we think of a police officer, uh, the people who are who are participating in the study and becoming RCMP officers thereafter, right? They're they're putting up their hands to serve. Compared to the general population, they have higher levels of honesty and humility. They have higher levels of agreeableness and conscientiousness. They have higher levels of fairness and modesty. Higher levels of sociability, gentleness, patience, altruism. So here's the thing. All of those are absolutely things that we want associated with our, our police officer, with everybody who's putting on a uniform, right? Because they're looking after all of us. But at the same time, if you've got higher levels of, of sociability and altruism and these very positive traits, it means you're community-minded, you care about other people. Now we have a bit of a puzzle, right? Because somebody who cares about somebody else and in general cares about humans this is the person you're sending out to deal with humans that are having terrible, terrible things happen to them. They're now likely going to care about the human and the terrible thing that's happened. So now we have a problem because if you care about them, now all of a sudden it does start to increase your risk, right? Mm -hmm. If you didn't care at all, yeah, that's not a problem, but they do care. And a lot of the narrative about police officers in particular is you're hiring people who don't care. You're hiring people who, you know, are, are, uh, you know, heartless sort of uh, people. Yeah. They're just there to push people around. But power the data is not and blah blah blah. Yeah, and it's like mm, no. The data is not supporting that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you'd need a pretty impressive explanation for why the data runs directly contrary to what you're arguing. I mean, I, and I've never seen that. Like I said, I, I've got friends and family who serve. I yeah, uh, they've been amazing people. Yeah. These are people who just want to make the world a better place for everybody, and and they feel good when they can help. Yep, I so agree. that puts them at risk. And there's outliers in every aspect of life, everywhere you go. I don't know if anyone that's ever been to a job that didn't have that one person was like, uh, you know, so of course there's some <laughs> of those in the military. There's some of those in first responders, but for the majority of my experience, they're all big hearted people that want to do more for their communities. And I think that that's awesome. Resiliency. How do you test for resiliency? Well, that's a complicated question. So even in the in the academic literature, there's a lot of debates about what resiliency means. And even the definition of resiliency is actually pretty hotly debated, depending on the, on the context. So if you're going to test for resiliency, really what you're looking at the in most cases, and you could have five academics here and you might get five different answers. So right. I think in general, what I think you're looking at is somebody that can experience something that's stressful or challenging. And they're able to use the resources that they have, whatever those are, in order to sort of bounce back from that stressor. Yes, it hurts, and yes, that sucked, but I'm okay. I, I know how to. I know how I can recover and how I can cope. And so that notion of resiliency, we can ask people about it directly. How often do you bounce back? Do you feel like you bounce back? We can also ask them for things that we know are are very likely related to risks for a variety of mental health challenges, uh, constructs like anxiety sensitivity, for example, uh, uh, fear of negative evaluation, things like that, where we can go, you know, are you higher or lower than the general population on these things? That's a way for us to test the resiliency. Mm -hmm. But I think the there's a bit of a problem with the problem. There's a caveat that I think is so important about the word resiliency, mm -hmm. and that is we want resilient people. But all the data so far says everybody who's putting on a uniform is already pretty resilient when they're putting a the uniform on. And there's been some research that has come out of uh, a few different groups, including nurses, for example, who has been able to, to provide some early evidence that suggests even with the most resilient people in the most supported environment with the best possible leadership, you can still overwhelm them because there's a point where you have to address the fact that these are still human. So if you work them 24, 7, 365, no break, relentlessly, and you're and the external environment is abusing them, it, it, at some point, these are humans at some and yeah. caring you, you're mm -hmm. gonna break them down and you'll burn them out. Yeah. And the myth 
for the last I don't know, 100 years or so has been we just have to make them individually more resilient. And and that's probably true. We can boost their individual resiliency some more. I believe we can give them better skills yet. But at some point, the community has to own part of this and go, we're burning them down. Yep. We're burning them. We're not funding them. They're care. overworked. They're understaffed. They're undermanned. They're not supported. Yeah. Like, okay, this is our fault. You know, that's the way I, I see it at the moment. And it's like, we need to shift that paradigm. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned point, nurses. Right? Yeah. Like, it's also us. So right? What did you do today? Did you, <laughs> to like, what did you do today to help? Like, that you did nothing? Of, yeah. Unconscious <laughs> patterns, you know, uh, I can't remember the quote off the top of my head, uh, but that led me to uh, spirituality. I was curious, like, is there any like sort of diving into spirituality or religion or anything like that for this study or, or was there not? Cause I know that that can be touchy, but like I said, I like to notice patterns and a lot of the people that I seen who were able to be resilient or endure certain things for some reason, they all had a religious background, you know, they pulled on or reached out to like what they felt like it was an external force to give them that extra boost in those really, really dark times. And I was wondering if you had anything, any questions similar to that in your study. We have a little bit. Uh, okay. And so part of the little bit that we've got is that we're checking, we ask people like, have you, have you got, do you have a religious background? Are you spiritual? We, we test for, we ask for things like religiosity and spirituality. And I, I agree. Those can be huge better. Like those can be huge factors towards resiliency. Uh, we've also seen that, there's risks associated with things like moral injury that are coming out uh, with yep. getting increased attention. So uh, I'm, there's lots of famous military examples at home here uh, in Canada. Uh, General Romeo Dallaire is, is quite famous uh, with with how he has been uh, a big advocate for watching for things like PTSD and and the associated challenges that can that can ensue. Moral injury is really where you've got a, a where something's happened that's violated one of your deeply held values. And in those cases, you sort of got an interplay between religion and spirituality and values and, and the real world. Uh, and I, I certainly think that those things can be big gains for you. But I, I also think that there's and, and we'll try and study this in, in the study as the, as the data collection continues. But but there's also there can also be some challenging questions that get asked. Right. How did God, for example, allow this to happen? Yeah. Uh, if, Right. If God is good, how could this possibly be what I'm being sent to deal with right now? And yeah. and why aren't we making bigger changes? So I, it gets really complicated quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I've I've had a few on uh, my podcast that, that have said something similar because spirituality in my mind is not always religious, but in that regard, there's at least two I can think of that did have religious issues in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as one, his spirituality was, he was very patriotic. I love this country. And then went over to a war zone and saw his country doing things that he didn't agree with morally. And then that was the moral injury. And it's like, it's really interesting. I feel like there's a little caveat. There's a little connection there somewhere about spirituality that I've been trying to explore a little bit more, but that's that's a topic that I always just assumed I knew the meaning of, you know, and never really actually add any contextual information to it. So now I'm like, I feel like a toddler. So I'm going to I'm gonna move on from that one. Uh, what was the other one? If you're interested in the spirituality stuff, there were some colleagues of mine. Uh, I, I was part of the team. They led the work, though. So, uh, up on the uh, the SIPSERT website, there's a PSP moral injury guide that they released just a couple of weeks ago that tries to tease apart those concepts with uh, with morals and virtues and religiosity and spirituality in these interactions. So it's a if you're interested, there's a there's some some good reading there. I think uh, yeah. if you're so inclined, yeah, I'll pull so. that down. I, I, everything that you sent, I read and I loved it. I was like, it was just so much fun because it's uh, my favorite thing, and I'll just get to it because I keep teasing it. I, like I see it and I want to ask it, but I'm waiting till the right time. But it's basically, uh, I feel like everybody's approach only has a bit of it. Yours, in my mind, has the proactive. It has the maintenance and then it has if you do get trauma and you do have these mental health challenges here's how we fix it you know so i was hoping we could dive into like maybe just some sh short small few examples of so the proactive part like what are some things people can do to be proactive about their mental health and then after that maintenance and then again like once if there's problems how do you help it i think the first thing that they can do is they can look for 
there's good evidence-based and evidence-informed coping skills. So there's different kinds of coping skills. There are good coping skills and there's good coping skill programming that's currently available. Some of it for, for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and so the real, the real trick is just making sure that you're picking stuff that's coming from a good source because there's a lot of sort. Uh, in the United States, National Center for PTSD is one of the best in the entire world uh, right. for those for picking up that kind of training. Learning more about it, that the education component is a great place to start if you're being proactive. Then practicing. So not waiting until you have a mental health injury to start using the skills. Skills like uh, mindfulness, skills like being able to engage in, in cognitive challenging. So are you just letting a thought go by and just accepting it as true? Or did you stop and question what evidence is there for whatever that thought is? Right. And I think a lot of people think the first time you should go see a, a mental health professional is after you've got a mental health injury. I'm not convinced at all that's true. I think you might want to see a mental health professional just like you see your your family doc. It might not be a bad idea to check in with them you know, once a year or uh, right. Take advantage of, some of the IC, the internet delivered cognitive behavioral therapy programming that's available in in the world right now. Mm -hmm. That's a good place to start to be proactive because you can you can rely on those content and that material as as having a broad evidence base that can help. I like it. And then, uh, then the maintenance. Yes, yeah. <laughs> there's two that you mentioned in your study: exercise. Exercise should be really promising. Uh, and then. Yeah. You know, maybe that was maintenance. That was a good coping skill. And the other one was meditation, I believe. But okay, maintenance. Both <laughs> exercise and meditation can both help for sure. Uh, yeah. the, there's lots of evidence there. There's a tremendous amount of evidence, uh, in particular for regular daily exercise and for watching for watching slippery slope coping skills, right? One glass of wine can turn into two glasses of wine, can turn into three glasses of wine relatively easily if you're not careful, right? Yep. One night a week of that can turn into two, can turn into three, can turn into four relatively easily. So, but exercise can do the same thing. And, and exercise is not a cure-all. There's, there's some extraordinarily fit people that I've had the privilege of working with who have difficulties with PTSD, because like I said, at some point you can overwhelm even the, the strongest, most resilient human being. Yep. But as a rule, regular daily exercise, resistance training, and cardio are good for just about all that ails you. And if nothing ails you, they're probably good for that too. Yep. So it's a really great piece. Engaging in, in mindfulness behaviors, this is good. Meditation, this is good. The, the data shows stopping and, and taking a break. This is part of what those uh, one-minute daily surveys that we get people to do are, are doing. Just, just stop for 60 seconds. And just reflect on the last 24 hours of your life. Yeah. Watch what happens. Uh, pay attention to the choices that you're making when you take that minute. Like, mm -hmm. have I taken the time off? Did I do something fun today? When we talk about self-care, it gets all wrapped up in ooey-gooey sort of floofy uh, yeah. concept. But you know what? All of our Olympians do incredible work with respect to self-care for all of their physical and their mental health. That's part of how they become Olympians. Yeah. So if we're okay with the Olympians, as we should be, as being sort of pretty good ideals for the rest of us, it should be okay then for you to take a break, for you to do self-care, for you to say, no, I can't take that extra thing on right now. For you to yeah. say, you know what? I am going to sit and meditate for an hour because it's good for my mental health and I need that. That's part of maintenance in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And keeping a record, Doing that, not everybody has access to the monitoring tools that, that we've built for the RCMP and that we're, we're trying, it's not because we're not trying to make them available, it just takes time, right? But right, right. now we don't all have that. Um, but there's lots of there's lots of online options. And there's lots of ways for you to monitor your own health over time. Monitor it. Check it. It doesn't take long. And yeah. just say, am I going up or down? And if I'm starting to get into trouble, okay, stop, take a half hour, review. If you're, a, if you're an Olympic runner, Right. And something hurts. You're going to stop and you're going to check out what hurts to make sure you're not going to just, you know, blow Let's through and risk pulling out. Right. Because it's not good. I right. mean, maybe if you're in the gold medal race, I, I don't know. I've never been an Olympic runner. So maybe yeah. in the gold medal race, I might push through, but I'm not going to do it while I'm training. I'm going to get help and boost my training. That's the biggest thing I think with maintenance is we got to start treating our mental health like we would treat anything else. If you care about it, it's going to require daily investment. Yep, I agree. Uh, I was talking to uh, Lieutenant Sarko, and he mentioned he uh, some study. I'd have to find it, but uh, it was seventy percent of all response are to mental health situations. 
So I think that there's likely an ancillary benefit to our first responders having so much knowledge and experience with mental health when responding to something that may be mental health related. And I, 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 I hope it has like a contagious effect of like, okay, let's just, let's all take a moment and just apply some logic to this and do more with our mental health. I agree. Some of the training that we've been able to, that we've, that we've rolled out, we've actually heard feedback from our participants that are in uniform saying things like, you know what, this is actually very helpful. This can help with other, like, you know, are we able to use this just generally speaking? Well, uh, lots of good mental health care practitioners, they're using those tools to help you when you're in distress. So if we get our first responders good at using those tools for themselves, they can also use them to help all of us in distress as well. It's, it, it's not magic. It's skills yeah. that we can all develop together. It's exactly. just their hard skill, right? Yep. Uh, so you mentioned in the study avoidant avoidant coping strategies. Those are bad. If you're doing avoidant, what what does that mean? What are those strategies? What are some examples of that? So avoidant coping strategies, uh, alcohol use is, a, is an avoidant coping strategy, right? Uh, anytime where you're experiencing some kind of a, an emotional response and your response is to deny the emotion, right? Not, doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that you can stop every time, especially if you're a first responder, you can't just stop necessarily and, yeah. and experience the emotion. But anytime you're denying that the emotion is happening outright, especially if that's happening in, in a circumstance where it shouldn't be happening. So you're at home, everything is safe. And all of a sudden you're filled with rage and you're yelling at your kid. Okay. Well, what's going on there, right? Yeah. Uh, so avoidance is anytime we're sort of pushing that away and saying it's not real, it's not happening, uh, I'm, or, or in some cases doing outright behavioral avoidance. That's the most common one. I'm going to go to great lengths to not go to that particular parking lot because every time I go there, I get anxious because I was in a car accident in that parking lot or because I saved someone in a car accident in that parking lot. Right. As soon as you start seeing those avoidant thoughts, those avoidant behaviors, those avoidant coping mechanisms, those are pretty good indications that you might benefit from getting a little bit of help. It doesn't have to be anything more catastrophic than I'm, I'm, I recognize I'm having trouble. So yeah. if you can tackle it yourself, great. But if not, that doesn't mean anything's wrong. Sometimes you need a bit of an extra pair of hands because you're not quite sure how to deal with that particular avoidance problem that you're having. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I've been doing this mental health stuff for like eight, nine years, like pretty, it, it's all for me. But even now, like sometimes when I meditate, I'm like, oh, I'm avoiding that, you know? And it's like, oh, okay. Even now I catch myself doing old coping mechanisms that will lead to more drama in my life. And it's, yeah, I feel like the I had a, one lady come on, she calls it a brilliance moment. She's like, after each call, just take a brilliance moment, meditate for about a minute, 60 seconds. She's like, just wash yourself of it and then move on to the next one. I was like, okay. I was like, I like that idea. Uh, that could be a good way to do things. Yeah. That's an interesting <laughs> approach. You are highlighting the importance of mental health for the first responders in this community. Uh, I feel like your study is outstanding. You have things in place that are going to continue to give you data. That's going to help support them. But if you were to like, I don't know, guess where this is going or things that you could do to improve it, what are some things that you would do to change the current environment to make it better? I think the first thing that I would do is is figure out ways to to scale up things that we know work at the individual level. I think that might be one of the first things that I would do because I think that's one of the most palatable things that we can do because people are really focused on the individual level in some cases for good reason. So I'd make sure, for example, that we, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd make sure that the, the training that we know works, you've got, and we're building it. You're, we're now seeing programs that are coming out uh, that are evidence-based programs. I make sure that you have a few different evidence-based training programs that were available for everybody because nothing works for everybody all the time. And and sometimes you need it communicated in a couple of different ways, at least I do, before I learn something. So one teacher can tell me something and I don't get it. Another one says the exact same thing in a slightly different way. Got it that time, right? So, so I would magically make it those all available to everybody who's putting on a uniform everywhere. The second thing that I would do is, is I would find a way to try and do a better job of supporting the leaders. Because in a lot of cases, we're putting a tremendous amount of weight on the shoulders of, of these leaders and we're adding things. Now deal with mental health. Now deal with EDI. Now deal with the economic crisis. Now, by the way, there's a poverty problem that we're going to have you deal with. <laughs> but you didn't see that one coming. Also, we want you to do, oh, and we're going to cut your budget by 10% because you know we really want to reduce taxes this year. 
okay, well, yeah. that's putting these people into impossible situations. And it makes it hard then for them to advocate for their people. So I think providing them with the support and the freedom to be advocates for their people in a way that then the community will listen. And then I think that leads sort of into the next related one, which is we got to look at the organizations as a whole, not the, not the leaders and the people. I think the leaders are trying as hard as they can in some really impossible situations. Right. But as a community, it, I think you, you put it really well there, uh, actually, earlier on in the talk. What's your safety worth to you? Right? And if it's worth something to you, how much? Because most of the time, and don't quote me on this, we need a firefighter to double check my fact check me here. But in most cases, in most cities, I think the rule of thumb is you have to be able to get a fire truck to wherever they are within seven minutes or less. And we all agreed that that was a really good idea because we didn't want to burn in our houses and we didn't want things to collapse. Right. So we said, okay, well, Let's do the research, figure out what the numbers are, and how many how many fire stations do we need throughout a city so that we're all safe? And everybody was like, yeah, yeah. good, let's do that. Great idea. Right? Yeah. Hey, so let's treat the entire public safety community that way. And even our firefighters were tasking, even with all even with all of those kinds of rules in place, we're overtasking our firefighters because in many cases, firefighters and paramedics are shared services. And if we're short on paramedics, we send our firefighters out, and sometimes it's one and the same. So at a system yeah. level, let's, let's have a real conversation about this. Do we? How do we make sure we have enough police? How do we make sure we have enough paramedics and firefighters? And at the same time, I do think it's a fair question to have, which is, are we sure we're using the right tools for the right job? So right. you're not going to, you certainly wouldn't get me as a psychologist. If somebody's having a mental health crisis, in the middle of the park at three o'clock in the morning, sending me to go deal with this. I'm not trained or equipped either. I, I don't know what you're going <laughs> to do in that situation, right? Yeah. But but it, those kinds of challenges have really become part of the discourse. And, and we're sort of having a, a blaming discourse. But realistically, we need to take a step back and figure out how did we end up with someone in the park at three o'clock in the morning that was having a mental health crisis in the first place? Like, Right. I'm pretty sure that we could have intervened sooner. I'm just, or there yeah. could have been something done sooner. Like, yeah. And by the time you're sending a police officer to deal with the situation, well, we as a community failed a lot of the law. Like we failed multiple times before we got. There. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's one of the organizational and system things we need to take a look at. And I think we need to, instead of doing it in a sort of a combative way, I think we need to do it in a in a roundtable sort of way where we all go, it's us, right? Our the police are the community. The community are the police. The same is true for all of our public safety. These are our friends and our neighbors and our family members. So right. let's sit down and get together and figure out how are we going to do this better. And if that means we need more resources, okay. But but uh, what's your safety work? Well, yeah. Let's do it. Exactly. It reminds me of my uh, getting help for my own mental health stuff. The very first step was ownership and accountability. And I feel like we have a sick society and it's time for us to take ownership and accountability for it and figure out how do we can get improve it. Because if we're not honest about it, it's just never going to get fixed, you know, mm -hmm. but on that, uh, I just wanted to ask you anything else jump out about your study. I know we're getting close on time. We I don't want to go over. <laughs> Sorry. I, was having a, I, was so, a great I feel like we could talk like this for like <laughs> six hours, but, uh, yeah, one last thing, it was just anything in the study you found super cool, interesting, or just shocking. You're like, wow, I didn't see that coming. And then after that, how do we help you? How do we support you? And where do we find you? I think the biggest thing that, that we were really pleasantly surprised about uh, was just how grateful all of the participants have been in the study and and their commitment and their dedication. Because doing a research study is always harder than, than actually just implementing services. But they're so committed to, to their colleagues, past, present, and future. And that's just consistently inspirational when we watch their dedication. And it, it makes it a real privilege for me to be able to work with all of them. So... Uh, it, it shouldn't surprise me, but it, it, it never ceases to just inspire me just to how dedicated they are to everybody else. So that's my favorite. That's awesome. Awesome. And how do we support you? Where do we find you? Uh, well, uh, you, you can support me by supporting all of them. <laughs> that's, that's the best way to help I love me. It. Appreciate uh, it. RCMPstudy.ca has tons of information. We try and make it all as, as open and as freely available as possible. I would encourage people to, to take a look, read more share the information, share the, the one-page results that we've got. They're really easy to consume, and they've got short messages that I think we can debunk a lot of myths, and we can use that debunking to help those folks who are protecting and serving all of us. 
Awesome. I really appreciate you and all that you're doing. And I appreciate your teams and all this stuff that you're coming out with and the angles you're hitting it from where I think that's how you kill the stigma, you know, like just like out of the gate, it was like, um, it was assumed that we're just, uh, we're, we're hiring the wrong people. And I feel like the same thing could have been said about the military and so many other categories. And the fact is people that go into those jobs are already more resilient because they're mentally prepared for that. They want to do that. I feel like, but on that note, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait till we cross paths again. Soon. Thank you very much for everything. I really appreciate it.